So what we have on the bench now is a beautiful, very well kept Kicker ZX2500.1. So no shorts yet that I'm seeing. Okay, no shorts up with Fetch. So we are safe to go ahead and drop some power into this thing. So we do have class D switching, we're drawing a 2.3 amps of idle current uh, at 10.6 volts worth of input. And if you see that, you see that, that variance in duty cycle there, that is actually the sine wave playing. And I suspect the sine wave will be nice and clean on the speaker terminal if we go over here to the speaker terminal, let's have a look. Yeah, nice clean sine wave. So, okay, well the amplifier seems to then be performing absolutely fine. Something which I thought you guys might be interested to know is this is actually a full bridge amplifier. As you can see there are waves both on the positive and on the negative speaker terminal, 180 degrees face from each other, which uh, sets up a full bridge um, push-pull scenario on the speaker terminals to drive this up. So yeah, this amplifier is working fine. I've just checked the notes from the customer and he said that it was powering up but making no sound. So that says to me that he accidentally had the switch switched onto high level inputs or um, there's an issue with his uh, signal source that's causing there to be no sound but the amplifier itself is, is working perfectly fine. Gave me audio from the first second I put the RCA in, uh, so yeah, it's fine. Okay, so on the bench now is a little Torrance HD 3000 and this is a 2 ohm version. So this is actually got the exact same internal rail voltages and the exact same like inside stuff going on as a 6000 watt RMS 1 ohm amplifier. The only difference is is that this doesn't have enough parallel components to be able to deal with 6000 watts passing through it. However, if you had enough impedance rise that brought your final load, your final 1 ohm load up and above 2 ohms at all times, you could essentially run this amplifier, this little 3K 2 ohm version, as a 6000 watts RMS 1 ohm amplifier and it will work fine. Okay, loaded outputs. Power supply section seems fine. Okay, so let's power it up and see whether this works fine and the guy just doesn't know what they're doing. Okay, so we have 1.4 amps worth of idle current draw. Output section here we have, do we have class D switching? Yes, we do have class D switching. And let's see whether we have sine wave output. Yes, we do. So the freaking thing works fine then. Let's go up to 12 volts, 14 volts. Yeah, that's working fine. Oh, this is driving me nuts, man. People keep sending me stuff that works and it's sh because it's waste of my time. Guys, what the heck? It is the curse of the stream. All of the amps work. Nothing is broken. It's, it's the opposite to what you usually want, isn't it? Usually you want stuff to work, but no, I want stuff to not work. This amp does appear to be working absolutely fine. Which is super annoying. Right, I'm so done of ha of doing a live stream. I've got loads of packages downstairs, so we're gonna find one that's got a bloody issue. Okay, well, again, I'm really confused. That seems to be working fine, so I don't know what the customer's talking about. Doesn't this? I'll tell you, the last three streams, every single stream, the amps that I've grabbed grabbed out have all worked fine. I'm right, just opening another box, please, dear Lord, please let there be something wrong with this one. Please let there be something wrong with this one. Okay. Ah, JL Audio. HD series. Uh, the HD 1200.1. Uh, really nice little amplifier. Way overpriced. Absolutely horrifically expensive. But it is a cool little lamp, but it's not worth... Oh, for f sakes. I hate it when people send me these amps. They don't include the power connectors. Very frustrating. What am I supposed to do? Can magic some wires onto there. More volts. Let's give it a quick test and see whether this one has a fault or whether this one's working fine as well. Okay, I'm not, I'm not even going to take the back off this one. I'm just going to try and power it up and see what happens. Um, let's have a look at what the customer said actually for this one. See what the what he was saying the issue was. Okay, I think this one was that the uh, power lights were flashing green and red, which would suggest protect mode. So I'm just going to go ahead and confirm that is the case that this amplifier is actually in protect and not working because okay 0.6 amps worth of current draw uh, we have 0.6 amps again it's it's trying to draw a lot of current I think it's trying to power up now uh, I think the light is probably on the face that is uh, down here so can I can I see that without can I see the light without disturbing these wires yep flashing green red okay cool so Luckily, I think this one might have output section fault. Might be in protect because of output section fault. So let's uh, 
remove these sketchy wires. Right, so I've just popped the uh, top case off, and to get the top case off, you have to uh, unscrew from the sides here, and you also need to uh, so remove the top, and then you also need to remove the daughter board, which has all the sort of RCA preamp stuff on it uh, because it's completely covering this board. Once you've removed that, you can uh, kind of access the main amplifier and power sections of this board. And um, I don't know if we can zoom in here, but what I notice is we have a little stalactite. Stalag this, the couple of capacitors here um, have failed. Actually, it looks like all, all four of them actually look kind of bad. I mean, this one, this one's got its uh, internals oozing out of it, <laughs> which looks like a scary protrusion from a horror film. Ah. So that's cool, I guess. Um, the other four look bulged um, in varying intensities. So now these these capacitors, these are the um, these are the final filter capacitors. These are going to be getting rid of any residual noise and class D switching that the inductors haven't dealt with spikes and stuff like that. Little little bits, small bits of noise um, remnants of the class D switching that the inductor is supposed to get rid of. Um, Okay, so let's check between um, these FETs here and see if we have a short. So yeah, we have a short between drain and source of this FET here, and also gate. So all three legs of this FET is toast. And these other ones I can't quite get to because the caps are in the way. You're gonna have to go ahead and remove this heat sink now. This actually has a bunch of bolts on the bottom, so we can go ahead and remove these. And then that heat sink will come off and we can access the back of those MOSFETs um, just to kind of read their legs a little bit easier. And there we go. So that comes away. Put that down to one side carefully. Now we can actually access these FETs fully from the back. So no short there. No short there. No short there. No short there. So it appears that the issue, yeah, no dead, no dead FETs over on this side. So the issue is over on this side then we have at least two dead FETs over here. So what we're going to go ahead and do at first is just cut these ones off because we know that they're dead anyway and then what we'll need to do when we complete a repair is we'll need to re replace at least these four MOSFETs it'd be good practice to actually replace these four as well so we're going to actually replace all eight of these output MOSFETs anyway just for good measure just to make them all fresh brand new I think in this amplifier yes each each individual FET has its own final drive buffer check this out so in most amps you'll have gate resistors uh, by the FETs, but in these JLHDs, there's actually no gate resistor. You have a gate drive buffer, which is literally right on the gate. <laughs> so, rather than having a gate resistor, which is needed to kind of combat the ringing and the kind of um, flyback you get through the gate trace, uh, driving the capacitive load, which is the MOSFET gate, here, they've done away with needing a gate resistor by simply having the final drive buffer MOSFET transistor right next to the gate literally so let's see do we have any damage on this transistor probably not by the looks of it they're, they're a lot more these little transistors are probably fine and therefore the rest of the drive circuit is probably fine what actually caused this amplifier to fail in the first place it may have failed um, it may be that the MOSFETs failed which then caused some strange kind of switching behavior which cook the uh, capacitors here or it's the amplifier has been clipped to death which killed the capacitors which then presented a kind of shorting environment on the MOSFETs while they were switching which caused them to fail so all right let's go ahead and a couple of things we need to do then is we need to find some replacement FETs uh, maybe buy some if we don't have any in stock that are suitable and we need to dismantle the rest of this board out of the heat sink so that we can access the solder connections obviously for the capacitors and the MOSFETs to get this uh, get this repair underway so as well we got this apart I thought I'd you the back of the PCB which where we have most of the drive circuit for the output section it's uh, just based on the IR 2010s same driver you'll see in band of Viking 7k 5k that kind of thing um, JBL 14001 uses this as does the 7001 and the 24001 um, you even find like um, precision power, even like Boss Audio using this driver. Like, you know, this driver doesn't dictate the quality of amplifier by any means. It is just a way of driving uh, an output section MOSFET, you know, Class D MOSFET here. So yeah, it's fine. Some um, sort of final drive buffery stuff over here. We've got a little 10 ohm resistor um, that's going to be in between the output of this and the probably the input to the uh, little buffer transistor. Like this is a beautifully put together amplifier. I mean, even over here, right? You see these little things. These these are individual tiny little inductors, and they look like 
they are around the auxiliary voltage supply generation circuit. They're going to be super smoothing out, making all the auxiliary voltages very, very clean, very smooth. Any ripple on them, any sort of high frequency noise is gone. Um, so there's a lot of thought put into this tiny little board. So I get why it's expensive. It is designed from scratch by JL Audio. Um, so yeah, I do understand the price of this, but you know, there are much, much cheaper 1200 watt amplifiers you can buy that are that are fine, absolutely fine. You don't really need this level of sort of thought and quality into a car amplifier for the most part. Most people don't really need this and would actually benefit from spending the money on having something a little bit more powerful as opposed to, you know, all of the time and effort that's been gone into this design. I do respect it, I do appreciate it, but would I recommend it? Uh, no, I'd recommend someone save their money and get something cheaper or actually just get something more powerful that's going to sound better anyway because it's more power. So anyway, the reason that I got this out was because I need to take these caps off, so let's go ahead and do that. We've got the um, leads for the caps just down under here, and actually, this is going to be a bit of a pain in the arse. Um, a couple of the leads for the capacitors here are actually doubly connected, they're right up against these little um, ceramic surface mount caps. Uh, now if I go cooking up the leg for these capacitors, I, I might end up overheating these little ceramic caps. So we're going to see how it goes. If they come off really quickly, then it's fine. But if I'm having to hold the soldering on on there for too long, then I might go ahead and remove these um, ceramic caps first then change out the main caps just so I'm not overheating these little ceramics here. Okay so I finally received the replacement output filter capacitors for this JL Audio so we're going to go ahead and fit these now. You know I actually had a relatively hard time finding uh, film caps that were small enough and the right values to go in here. All of the film caps that I could find from normal suppliers seem to be way way bigger than these ones. Uh, I did eventually find some but yeah very strange. Alright, the new filter caps are fitted. I've got to tell you guys, these boards have single-handedly the highest thermal mass I have ever come across in my time repairing car amplifiers. This f***ing thing, this tiny little thing, doesn't matter how long I held the large soldering iron on for, doesn't matter how long I preheated the board for, doesn't matter how high I turned my soldering iron, that thing just wicks away heat like nothing I have ever seen before. Guys, don't don't work on these as your first amps. Right, with that out of the way then, um, let's go ahead and turn our attention to the output section. So we have removed all of the output MOSFETs in advance. So I think that we can probably go ahead and power this up now and see whether we get pulses on the low side um, gate pads for these FETs. Let's go ahead and power it up I think and see whether we get low side um, pulses on the gate pads. Right so let's first of all pulse the remote a couple of times just to get some rails built. Okay pretty high voltage in this thing giving it, given it's only a 1200 watt amplifier. Holy shit 90 volts okay. 90 volts on the high side, low side then low side gate. So this only has a single positive rail so we have half rail on the speaker terminals at all times when this starts to oscillate. So that's the high side, this is the low side. Let's see if we get any pulses. I don't know if this amplifier even provides pulses when there's no FETs fitted, but I just want to see what there is on here. Okay, no pulses on there. You know what, I, I genuinely don't think we're going to get pulses uh, on this style, of, this style of circuit here. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for continuity between these two banks. So you can see here we've got this is one side, this is the other side. On the high side we have our 110 volts um, and then on the gate of the high side we have about 15 volts there. 15 volts on both high side gates. On the low side we don't have anything whatsoever. Okay, now on this side, on our positive rail, yeah, we have the rail voltage there. On our high side gate, we don't actually have anything. But on the low side gate, we have our 15 volts. I'm going to go ahead and guess that that's actually correct. I think this is going to be some kind of strange JL Audio, like, full bridge. It's actually f***ing hell. 141 volts in a, in a freaking 1200 watt amplifier. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and guess that this is just a, a JL Audio style circuit in the way that works. Like, it's not exactly the same, both sides, but 
they are kind of mirroring each other in, in, in a way that leads me to believe, okay, maybe that's just kind of how they're designed to work. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is let that rail voltage sink to ground because that's, I mean, I wasn't expecting that much rail voltage in this tiny little thing, I have to say. It's probably going to be like 1500 watts into 4 ohms. Um, I haven't actually, I don't actually know the specifications of this amplifier, I haven't even looked it up, so. Uh, but I imagine it probably does the same power into a bunch of different impedances, probably 4 ohms, the fact that that rail voltage is so high. Holy sh**, yeah, look, look at it, man. 1200 watts are missing to 4 ohms. Yeah, and it probably does a bit more than that. It's probably underrated a little bit. So, no wonder, then, if you... So, this little board is technically... If you were to connect a 1 ohm load to it and you had enough impedance rise to bring it over 4 ohms, which is quite drastic, but if you did, this amplifier would behave like a... Like a four and a half thousand watt RMS amplifier. Yeah, so this, this has the same internal rail voltage as a full bridge four and a half K one ohm amplifier. And if you, your subs did have the impedance rise to bring that one ohm load back up over um, four ohms again, this, this, this little thing would perform like a four K plus amplifier. Absolutely insane. So the MOSFETs for this amplifier, so the MOSFETs finally arrived and I am Mr. Big Ball's confidence man so I just literally fitted them, reassembled it and uh, let's see, got uh, 12 volts, if I just adjust this a little bit, 12 volts going in, signal going in on the RCAs, power, okay there it is, this is a nice cheeky sine wave for you. Uh, and that's on one output, and if we move over to the other output, yes, full bridge, we have a sine wave on both outputs, and just to confirm that for you, that this is a full bridge, take the second oscilloscope probe, and there you go, it's 180 degrees out of phase with the other one. So, yep, little full bridge, awesome little amplifier, ridiculous amounts of power, um, potential because of its ability to play that power into the high impedance that 4 ohms I think it is as it goes up to so yeah really really cool well, that's a wrap all it was was those uh, output filter capacitors failed uh, likely from excessive clipping they really do take a hard time when you clip these amplifiers just from the amount of um, spikes and noise and stuff that comes through the inductor when the MOSFETs are hitting their limit on the rail voltage so Cool, all sorted, I'll enjoy it, test it, but I suspect that that's going to be absolutely fine.